I'm just going to say hello to all my beautiful peeps. It's great hello. to have you. Hello. Hi, Kim. <laughs> All right, well, let's get the ball rolling because our spotlight speaker is here. And so I am looking forward to speaking with her because I just love the stories that you share. So we have uh, Suzanne, uh, Susan Manet, I wanna make sure I say it right. Uh, she's with the Public Safety of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Uh, she's in Cedar Park, Texas. And uh, she, uh, if you remember, right she was on our show here uh, during the drone safety awareness week and so we're very lucky to have her back again i know she has a lot to share with us and so i will turn it over to you susan excellent well thank you so much i'm so happy to be here with everyone and share a little on public safety and drones um, so let me just share my screen and we can get started all right sounds good all right can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, All right, we can. We're good. All right, so um, just a little bit about myself. Um, so as, of, as you heard, I'm Susan Monet. I live in Texas right now. I'm a public safety pilot as well as a UAS instructor at Austin Community College. Um, I have my AUVSI top three certification. And then last year I got, the, I was very honored to get the Women and Drones 2020 Women to Watch in UAS Global Award in the public safety category. Um, and then, uh, so in Cedar Park, our flight trains regularly and we deploy as needed to help police and fire departments with search and rescue, SWAT calls, fire scenes, large events, and many other types of missions. And then in addition to flying for the city, I'm a technical writer by trade. And so I've worked on documentation for several UAS projects, including the Public Safety Unmanned Response Team, which is called PCERT. And that's a program which is used as a best practice for regional uh, UAS teams and those wanting to respond to mutual aid requests across the state of Texas. Um, you can see on the bottom corner, I used a very lighthearted picture for the presentation of my technical writing job, because I think a lot of people feel this way about tech writers, um, but I think it's a very important skill that we can bring to the development of the profession. Um, and then also, I'm really thrilled to share that this year I'll be joining the Drone Responders Board of Advisors. Uh, Drone Responders is a large international nonprofit organization, and they're dedicated to the advancement of public safety UAS. It's a really exciting um, company to be involved with. Uh, one of the projects that I'll be helping with and focusing on is partnering with different organizations to encourage girls to get involved with drones and STEM. So really excited. Um, so stay tuned. I'm sure there'll be a lot more information about that. I encourage you to visit the drone responders website and go and learn more about them and keep up with all these exciting projects. So drones in public safety, um, we found people come up to us and ask us questions when we are flying out in the community. And when people think about drones, they tend to think about the big brother spying on them, uh, you know, with public safety. And but really the main purpose for using drones in public safety is to save lives and to minimize risk to life. And they're, they're really used in so many different ways. And today I'd like to show you just a few examples of how they're used. And then I'm gonna to touch just a little on how we train in Cedar Park and also a little bit about the myths of thermal cameras. Maybe we can dispel a few of those for you today. So let's see. Um, one of the ways that we use drones is with large events. And the, the pictures you see here are of one of our 4th of July events, which was pre-COVID. Um, so before the event starts, we like to fly an automated flight pattern and we map the area and then we'll stitch those photos together and uh, print out the resulting picture in our mobile command bus. And we can use that uh, large scale picture because it's an up to date picture of, of where the event is in case of an emergency. So maybe we need to evacuate or there's a weather issue or an incident. We've got a really up to date picture of where all the exits are and how things are laid out. And then during the event as well, we can use drones to help watch the traffic patterns. We help coordinate with traffic officers on the ground. And then it's also useful for looking for lost children or even sometimes lost parents. Um, one of the other ways is that we can help with accident reconstruction and crime scene evidence. And um, drones can provide a top-down view of accidents. They can help with accident reconstruction. Um, and they really give a very good big picture view. And then what we can do is we can use specialized software such as PIX4D um, to get accurate measurements of the scene. 
For accident reconstruction, using drones reduces the time we have to block the road for traffic, which so then it creates a, a much shorter time when there's more danger there. And then officers have to spend less time uh, in the zone taking measurement and being in danger of being hit by passing vehicles when they gather the data. The picture on the right that you see is an automated flight that we did. We took a whole lot of uh, photos and then we stitched them together. And what we can do is during later investigation, we can then use that and zoom in and get a lot of close up detail of any aspects of the scene that we need to get. Another way we help is with SWAT aerial support. Um, drones can provide an aerial overview of a scene. They can provide um, good safety for officers. They can, uh, we can, we're in constant communication with the ground teams and we can let them know what's happening in the area. Um, we can keep a contact uh, track of any movement um, or if there's a suspect that runs away, we can start tracking them and, and help the ground crews keep track of them. This video that you're seeing is actually of a training session because typically we're not allowed to share footage of our real deployments for our SWAT, uh, SWAT uh, assists. And then often in these situations, we're flying with multiple agencies and multiple drones in the air at any one time. And so this is often a situation where we would use an air boss. And for example, we might have a situation, a typical example would be if we're monitoring a house, we had one where we had a drone on each side of the house and we had a drone above as well. So we had five drones in the air at any one time in a very small area. And so the air boss was critical in helping to coordinate flight heights and then the launch and recovery routes and procedures so that we could operate in a safe and efficient manner. Uh, on fire response, we can help with large fires such as wildfires, commercial structure fires, um, it's really great that we can then uh, provide live uh, feed for the fire command staff so they can get a visual of the situation. So without the drones, they typically have to rely on radio communications. So this is just an added benefit where they can physically see what's going on and they can help direct the crews to be more efficient and, and safe. Uh, one of the dangers that we found though with assisting with fires is that we do sometimes find private aircraft and helicopters fly over the scene because they're curious about what the smoke is so they'll fly into our scene and that creates a bit of an issue so we found that it's very beneficial even though it's daytime uh, even for daytime flights we find that we fly uh, using a visual observer because we really need those extra eyes out just watching for um, unwanted traffic in the area we also do, uh, in Cedar Park, we have a private airstrip that's close by. And so we will often monitor on the radio that airstrip just to make sure, you know, that of, of aircraft that are taking off and landing in the near vicinity. Um, so this photo here, uh, talking about damage assessment, what happened was we had a storm in our area and lightning struck the apartment complex and the fire department wanted to go on the roof and find out if there were any remaining hotspots. And so the only option they really had was to have a firefighter climb the quint ladder to assess the roof. Now with lightning still in the area, those quints, I don't know if you know, but those are pretty much um, uh, lightning magnets. And so it becomes a pretty dangerous situation to put a firefighter up on that. So what they did is they called us out and we used our thermal camera and we were able to, uh, to go and assess the situation and find out that there were no more hot spots on the roof. So we were able to do that without risking extra lives. Um, the other thing we can do for damage assessment is we can get into large scale flooding areas um, where tornadoes have been and we can go and assess damage long before we can get any vehicles into the area. Uh, on fire safety building inspections, we've done several projects helping out on that side. Uh, we assist the fire department with both internal and external building safety inspections. And this can help minimize risk to them as well. They don't have to climb up into, you know, on ladders and scaffolding and inspect things. And then also there's sometimes really tight spots that you have to get into that would be difficult for them to get to. And so we can help out with that. So what this picture is on, on, on the screen is a high school performing arts center. The inspectors needed to go and see inside this, the box right at the end. And um, it was a pretty challenging flight. I wasn't the one that flew it, my partner flew this one, but uh, as you can imagine being inside with all of those, those wires and electrical things, the GPS went absolutely nuts. Um, so you would fly a few inches and then stop and let your drone acclimate a little, then fly a little more and acclimate and fly a little more. The other thing was the prop wash. If you notice that um, the the bottom, uh, the 
the floor here is not flat, it curved up. And so the, when the prop wash, when it hit that curve, it created its own wind effect and would push the drone all over. So this was probably one of the more challenging flights we've had to do, but it really was a safety issue. You know, the inspector didn't have to go there and we achieved it. We got to the box and he was able to look on our live feed and see what he needed to see. One of our external projects that we've done um, was a building inspection for a new hotel that was going up and the firefighter would have needed, uh, the inspector, I'm sorry, would have needed to go to each floor and inspect these, these wooden panels to make sure that they were sealed correctly so that it's safe, uh, so that if a fire breaks out on any one floor, it doesn't easily spread to the other floors. So all of these panels have to be um, sealed up. And what that means is each, uh, each of the floors, there's there's a set of those panels you can see along each floor. Um, so instead of the firefighter or inspector climbing up the scaffolding, we actually took our drone and we flew up one floor at a time and we zoomed in and we projected that onto an external monitor so that they could just look at the monitor and get the feed there. The other nice thing is we recorded our flight and so they have it as a record in case they ever need it for any future arbitration or if, if anything happened with the building, they can show what they inspected. Uh, on the search and rescue side, we, we do a fair amount of search and rescue. The nice thing about the drones is they can cover a lot of area in a fairly short period of time. And then we find that we, we have a split screen where we can put the uh, thermal on the left and the uh, zoom camera on the right. And we find that that works really well in daytime and nighttime. It just gives you a, a different view of the scene. And what we do is we'll fly um, looking a little ahead of where the ground crew are going. And if we see anything of interest, then we can radio to them to go and have a look at that place. Um, we have a um, uh, infrared on the camera as well. So we can actually give them the GPS coordinates of, of the, the object that we've located. Um, and then uh, it keeps them safe as well. We can alert them to any um, issues that are up ahead. Uh, that's one of the search and rescue dogs that's running there. Uh, the public safety agencies use so many different types of aircraft and equipment. So I just wanted to share the equipment that we currently use. We have a Matrice 300. We use the Zenmus H20T camera. Um, and that's got the uh, thermal, the zoom, the wide angle, and then the infrared. Uh, we've got some Mavic Enterprise, which have the payload you can have on them with the spotlight, speaker, and beacons. And then we've got the Mini 2, and that is great for indoor flying. We do a lot of the the indoor practice um, for our SWAT deployments. And then in the top right corner, there's an orange box. We literally just call it the orange box. Um, we built it um, ourselves to um, help with live feed. Um, so, because what we found is if we're out at search and rescue or any kind of deployment where we're mutual aid with another department, it's really hard to fly when you have people looking over your shoulder trying to see your very little monitor that's in front of you on your controller. So we built this and we, we plug in with an HDMI cable and we have it in the back of our truck always. And um, we have a, a 50 foot cable to it so that we can stand far away if we need to. And the nice thing is, so for search and rescue, we can have two or three firefighters or commanders or something standing around that. And they can be an extra, you know, extra sets of eyes helping us to, to survey what we're currently flying over. So this box has been fantastically helpful to us. Um, on the training side of it, uh, we are extremely fortunate in Cedar Park. We have the use of the fire training uh, grounds in Cedar Park. So we're able to do a lot of practice. Uh, we have several um, blackout houses and training facilities that are indoors. So we actually get to practice a lot of indoor flying. Uh, all of the stuff you see flying around there is from the very dirty blackout house that we're practicing in. Um, this is really great, uh, helpful for communication. We stand in different areas because the grounds are so large and we practice with our radios. So radio communication between a VO and a pilot. Um, we hunt deer, uh, not literally hunt them, but we, we track them. Uh, there, there are deer all around the property and on the surrounding property. And we have found that hunting deer is probably the best practice for search and rescue because you, know, you get used to looking, trying to spot something moving and we use our thermal and we practice with that. And so the, the deer and um, one or two other little creatures get hunted on a very regular basis. And it's a, it's a lot of fun, but it's, we found it really has improved our skills for our search and rescue deployments. 
Um, the other thing we have on our property is we've built a NIST course and uh, we're able to use that to hone our skills and for when we're training other pilots uh, to just get, give them a test out to see where their skills are as far as um, uh, flight. Um, so that's all on our side as far as the public safety side and the training that we do. The one thing that I wanted to just end off with uh, was to show you a little about um, thermal cameras um, and that it's not like you see on TV. Um, so I think Hollywood has done a good job of convincing people that you can see through walls and floors with thermal cameras. And so people think that we spy on them inside their houses if we have a drone flying with a thermal camera. We have people asking us a lot when, you know, what are you flying? What kind of camera are you using? Oh, I suppose you're looking in people's houses. And that's, a, that's actually a pretty common conversation that we have. So my emergency, the Cedar Park Emergency Manager and I decided to put together a short demonstration to show people that thermal is not like you see on television. So what we did is there's, there's a, it's a split screen view and on the left is a cup of cold water and on the right is a cup of hot water. And we set the matrice uh, on the table in front of the cups and we set the camera up. So the split screen is with the thermal on the left and the zoom camera on the right. And then we took a pane of regular glass regular window glass and we slid it between the cups and I'm going to show you the video now and as you can see why you can still clearly see the cups in the regular camera but for the thermal camera the moment you put the pane of glass in front of the cups you can't see them anymore at all um, so what the thermal does is it reflects from the first the heat from the very first surface that it comes to so if you look carefully you can see a reflection of the matrice in the glass and what it's doing is reflecting the heat of the matrice it can no longer reflect from the cups because there's a solid object between them so hopefully with that short demonstration now you know the next time you uh, watch a police show on tv maybe you'll just smile a little and remember this demonstration and just figure that it's just hollywood doing their thing um, then the last thing that I would like to show you, again, to do with the thermal, and this is to do with public safety more as well, is the kind of ghost hunting thing where, where we all leave thermal imprints on things. And, and so what I did is we used the same split screen for the demonstration. Um, and I, I put my hand onto the wall. So we'll show that now. I put the hand, hand onto the wall for a few seconds. And when I removed it, now you can see on the right hand side, you, you wouldn't know that I was ever there, but the video is actually still running right now. And on the left, you can clearly see that the, the thermal imprint on the wall. And so what we, what we can use this for when we're you know, searching for either suspects or search and rescue or something is if someone, for instance, is hiding behind maybe one of those outdoor air conditioners and they're crouched down and they've got their hands on top of the machine, um, when they move away, you've literally got a minute or so if you're using your thermal where you could see their imprint of their hands that were literally on the top of the machine before they moved away. So it gives you an idea of, oh, that person was there about a minute ago. So now we know where to look. So um, I just thought that would be some fun, interesting thing to show. Um, so that's about all I have on the um, public safety side. I, I hope I've, I've taught, you know, shown you a little bit about what we do. And um, again, thank you so much for allowing me to present this to you today. That kind of wraps it up.